Welcome back to our afternoon session. Everyone in the room and everyone joining online. If you weren't here with us this morning, my name's Caroline Meeby. I'm the host uh, for the rest of the afternoon, as I was this morning. And I am a brown woman with glasses and curly hair, and I'm wearing a leopard print top today. So I hope uh, over the break you had a chance to grab something to eat and perhaps connect with some of the speakers for those of us who are here at the BFI. I noticed lots and lots of networking going on over lunch, which is fantastic, um, because there was so much food for thought in this morning session, and it will be the same this afternoon, I guarantee you. So I'm going to welcome our next panel onto the stage now. This session will explore the future of the levelling up agenda across the UK, and to discuss discuss this, we have a superb panel. We have Professor Paul Moore, who is Director of Future Screens NI and co-director of the Creative Industries Institute at Ulster University. We have Caroline Norbury, who is the CEO of Creative UK. We have Lara Ratnaraja, who is a cultural consultant. We have Josh, Dr. Josh Seipel, Senior Lecturer in Science Policy and Research Unit at the University of Sussex Business School. And to chair our session, we have Professor Bruce Tether, who is Professor of Innovation Management and Strategy at Manchester Business School at the University of Manchester. Um, you'll be able to submit questions on Slido as per before. And uh, without further ado, may I welcome the panel onto the stage? Give them a round of applause, please. Right. And over to you, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. See if I can get the technology to work. Okay, thank you. Hope you all had a, a lovely lunch. And for those of you who are in the room, I hope you uh, managed to speak to one, at least one person you hadn't previously spoken to. Uh, that, I think, is the point of uh, networking. But um, OK, so this session is about uh, levelling up. Uh, before I start, I should describe myself. So I'm a middle-aged white guy, unfortunately, perhaps. Um, I'm wearing glasses because I have them since I'm 16. Nice uh, pink shirt here. Underneath, a nice uh, cycling T-shirt because that's where my heart really is. But uh, anyway, that's me. And um, on to discuss levelling up. So leveling up, what does it mean? Um, so there, I think there are some international people in the audience and also online. So it's just, I think it's a fantastic phrase. But it's also a, a phrase which created an, all, an awful lot of expectation about you know, what our country could be like. Um, and taken literally, it kind of means, I think it means two kind of quite different things. Or maybe, maybe at least it means two quite different things to me, but maybe different things to others as well. But, one is a geographical uh, inequalities in this country. We have extreme uh, geographical inequalities for a uh, for a, an advanced country. Recent paper by um, some academics and uh, Ed Bowles uh, lays this out really nicely. Um, they are very very profound, and they have been around for a long time. I was a, a, an undergraduate in geography in the, the late 80s, and uh, we uh, we we were very aware of um, leveling up or the inequalities. It was in Newcastle and that kind of agenda was very much there. Um, so in the creative industries are very uneven spatially, as we may know. So they're very heavily concentrated in the UK, in London, the southeast. Uh, I did my own research of, a few years back looking at the extent of these inequalities. And if you think about leveling up as sort of two cars on the motorway, or cars on the motorway, then a, a one car is going fast, right? But in order to level up, the, the second car has to catch up with the first car. And if you take that analogy, the distance between the car in front, which is in London South East, is quite a long way ahead of the one behind, and it will take a long time to, to narrow these gaps. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a good ambition, I think, to, to reduce these inequalities. I think another aspect of this is really about opportunities, and it's about opportunities for people, different people, different parts parts of our population. Um, and sort of bringing this to mind, I did a study recently about Manchester and uh, the inequalities in Manchester. And on one hand, Manchester is seen as a great success story for the northern uh, creative industries. It's often seen as the hub, uh, or maybe alongside uh, West uh, Yorkshire, because we heard about that just before the break. But it's also a place of enormous inequality. So if you look at large parts of uh, Greater Manchester, there's very little 
creative industries in the east side of the city and, and around to the north. And this is also about the, uh, about the people who live there. Basically, there's a strong connection between prosperity and deprivation on the one hand um, and access to the creative industries on, on the other. So it's a, it, for me, it's at least partially about this uh, geographical divide and it's also about social divide. So this is what we're hopefully going to discuss in the next... Um, 40 minutes or so, but um, I just wanted to start by asking my panel about looking back, you know, what, what are we thinking of in the last five years as a successful um, leveling up initiatives that have been taking place in the UK over the last five years, and uh, how will we, you know, what will we learned about how to level up successfully? Maybe I could start here with Paul. Thank you, Bruce. Um, my name is Paul Moore. I'm a very old, white in every sense of the word, male. I'm wearing a dark suit and a white shirt. Um, I think you've touched on a crucial point where leveling up, as you might expect me to say, has got a geographical dimension. Northern Ireland would feel that it has missed out on leveling up initiatives to some extent, and there's a, quite a raging debate going on about that at the moment, particularly since the minister is this very morning laying down the budget, which will see at least a 10% cut for all arts organisations in the region. Um, partly our own fault, because we have not yet got the devolved government back. So it is a geographical issue. Having said that, I would defer a little bit from what Tracy was saying this morning, where she said that um, culture levels up. I don't think culture does level up, actually. I think strategising culture through policy intervention may have the potential to level up, but that's an entirely different thing. And one example I would give is that um, the Minister for the Department for Communities in Northern Ireland created a task force during COVID to look at how we might address the arts and heritage and sport. And I was fortunate to be on that. And while it was about immediacy, I kept banging on about the long term, to which the Minister eventually quite rightly said, well, what are you talking about? Tell me what that looks like. Eventually that turned into um, a number of schemes, one called Artwork, which Future Screens NI uh, manages and administers as the AHRC cluster for the region. And it created 72 three-year posts in arts organisations across the region. The second one is a scheme called CINE, um, which is run by Northern Ireland Screen. And it is creating apprenticeships within the creative industries, particularly in the screen industries, for the most disadvantaged young people in the region. Now, those would not have happened had we not taken the tactical opportunity which COVID offered to get into very direct relationships with government. I do realise, for those in the audience, that we can do that in Northern Ireland because it's a smaller region and we have more direct access. But that involves saying to government, what are the things that you need done and what do you need us to do? And in a pragmatic fashion, thinking about that. Because levelling up is not about one-off schemes. Levelling up is about creating a capacity infrastructure for the future. Okay, thank you. Caroline. Couldn't agree more. Um, so, sorry, for, the, for people who want to know, I am an ageless sex kitten. <laughs> 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 I have I positioned myself in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> I have olivey skin. Um, I have an interesting background of Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, and um, uh, and Mancunian, actually, uh, black background. And I am dressed in a black sparkly top, uh, brown trousers, and green suede boots. So levelling up. Um, I, I mean, I completely agree with you in terms of it has to be systematic and systemic and patient um, in order to work. So we are, I think sort of our electoral cycle means that we probably get maybe 18 months worth of work done to make change um, in, the, in each political cycle because everybody's either getting used to a new job, um, uh, getting, hoping for a different job, or getting on the campaign trail to, you know, get re-elected. So, you know, if you want to make change, we have to sort of start by really taking seriously how we make policy and implement it. Um, but going back to your question, rather than my soapbox, um, uh, one of the things that we started um, 
before create before uh, sort of our current in, in, incarnation is um, uh, Creative UK have been investing in uh, small creative businesses largely outside of London and the South East, just in England, um, but largely outside of London and the South East for probably about eight years. And um, we, but, but the, the history to this is there was a, a, a pot of investment that, um, that the coalition government had, which was called the Regional Growth Fund. I don't know if people remember this, but it was big chunks of money that largely went to local authorities, um, and then some of it went to big businesses to build things like call centres or invest in car plants. And I had a conversation with Vince Cable um, when he, he was the Secretary of State for Business, and he wanted to invest in uh, creative, he wanted to invest in the creative sector, and I said to him, well, look, it's great that you've got, you know, you, you're putting this chunk, these, this money out in millions, but actually most small businesses can't deal with that. They need 25 grand, um, particularly creative businesses, so they need that sort of money to invest in scaling their team, developing their IP, et cetera, et cetera. Long story short, we came up with a way in which we could take some of that investment and parcel it out and put it into small businesses in lots of different parts of the country. Um, and we did that patiently. We did that flexibly. So we didn't work like a, a, a grant organization. We didn't work like a bank. We, end, we had a relationship with the business. We followed them. We were there when things were bad for them. Um, and we provided more help for them. Um, long story short, uh, 70, the, the, the average length of time that an SME exists for is five years, is um, not five years, sorry, is two years. Um, and 70% uh, of our businesses um, were still trading after five years. I'm not quite sure what the figures are now, but I'm pretty sure that we're still far above the average. Um, uh, they were all employing more people, they were generating more revenues, they were exporting, they were investing in innovation. They were doing all the things that you want businesses that are scaling to do. Um, we did that really through a bit of chutzpah and being in the right place at the right time. It wasn't systemic, it wasn't planned. But um, eight, as I said, 80% of those businesses are outside of the southeast. Um, and what they've done is they've, we've continued to work with many of them. Some of those businesses are now investing in other businesses that, um, that we've introduced to them. Um, and uh, and, and within, within that sort of coterie, 50% of those businesses were in areas of high economic deprivation and low social inclusion. So, which is exactly the sort of, you know, the definition really of the levelling up areas. Um, and I think the key to it all was, um, was long term, it was very much a sort of a very straightforward, supportive relationship, which wasn't about doing lots and lots of reporting. And importantly, it wasn't based around a grant. So the end result of all of this was that we had a conversation about how do you pay that money back and how do we use that to then invest in other stuff? So I think that there are ways in which you can, um, uh, you, you know, you, you can do this sort of this sort of work, but it takes a long time. Um, unfortunately, we never got that money recapitalised. We've recapitalised it ourselves by um, uh, we've, we launched a twenty million pound fund th with a private sector partner about three years ago, and we're going to. Um, we've, we're in the process of recapitalising that now, so we should have about another £30 million pound fund. Um, but none of that really has been enabled through the sort of policy making that you've just, that you've just outlined. It's all really been, you know, uh, as I say, sort of been a bit of chutzpah and been in the right, pl right place at the right time. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Josh. Uh, right. Yes, I'm Josh Seipel. Uh, those uh, looking at me, I'm a white male, I'm American originally, uh, wearing a red tie and a navy jacket, it appears. Um, so um, one of the things which I think is really interesting about the issues that we face around leveling up, and which I, th I think um, Caroline um, and Paul have both sort of raised there, is this issue around sort of access to uh, 
opportunity. And I think particularly the issues around access to finance are really, really crucial so that businesses that want to grow, that, uh, that have an interest in growing, are able to get access to the capital that they want. And some of the work that we had done as part of our Creative Radar project had found that companies in what we called micro clusters outside of the largest, most established creative clusters um, in the UK, they wanted to grow more but they also didn't have access to the capital that they need. And this is exactly the, the, the phenomenon that um, Caroline identified. Now, I think there's, uh, an, uh, you know, there's a lot of really interesting th you know, movement in this space. And one of the things which I thought has been a very interesting set of experiments that's recently been refunded was the uh, Creative Scale-Up program, which was originally um, launched by DCMS and has now been refunded as the Create Growth program. And I think the thing which really made that interesting as a program was that in that case there was it was, there was an emphasis on targeting areas, one, outside of London, which are typically less likely to get access to uh, um, some private sector uh, finance. But there's also a real interest in trying to build demand for capital, so not necessarily just making it about access to, so providing extra capital, which is really, really important, but also helping companies on their growth journey to be able to know, know what was needed to get them to be investment ready. And I think that's a really interesting step. And I think one of the other things which was quite interesting about Creative Scale Up was there was a lot of interesting work around trying to get investors out to the places that they wouldn't normally be engaging with, talking to people who they might not normally see because they aren't necessarily in London or in the Golden Triangle of uh, Oxford and Cambridge, to actually see there's lots of really good investment opportunities outside of this immediate area. And as we look to trying to level up the UK, I think it's a really important aspect of this, trying to make sure that where there is money, and I think, I think, I think the work that um, Creative UK and, and Creative England before has been really good in trying to channel this out um, more broadly across the whole of the UK. Thanks, Josh. Lara? Um, my name's Lara Atnaraja. I am a Sri Lankan woman with brown skin, uh, neon, what can I say neon, neon yellow, it changes a lot, neon yellow hair and lime green hair, so God knows what you're going to make of that. And um, I have a lot of jewellery and tattoos. Um, or too much jewellery, as my member says. Um, I uh, just wanted to pick up something that Paul said. I don't think it is levelling up it either, um, because to have levelling up, you really need a significant investment into equitable infrastructure to even get to be level. Um, and secondly, is level the standard we want to have when that standard has, has proved itself to be kind of perpetuating systemic bias? Um, and promotes uh, or catalyzes marginalization. So I'll just leave that there. Um, but I think um, when we do talk about leveling up projects, um, where they've worked really well is when they are very unique to their place. Um, and that's where they've really, I think they can, they're not leveling up, but they are really making a shift, I suppose, in how those places um, occupy within cities or towns or within um, a, a kind of local landscape. Um, so. My example I was going to give actually was, uh, and I'm biased because I live in Birmingham, is uh, Moseley Road Baths and Borsalese Library, um, which is a grade two listed Edwardian building that was saved from closure by local community campaigning. Um, and they have, and I love this phrase, I have actually got this on, as a note, they have a coalition of the willing, which I thought was a really fabulous phrase. Um, and that is the, um, it's a groundbreaking collaboration between Moseley Road Baths, um, the Friends of Mos Moseley Road Baths, Birmingham City Council, Historic England, World Monuments Fund and the National Trust. And they've, um, from that local campaigning, they have now got around 15 and a half million of levelling up funding, which is going to work towards a big 30 million pound master plan. Um, and that will really transform what that, um, the public baths and library can be. And what I love about it and why I think it's been successful is it's responding to the needs of the communities it's serving. It's not being done to them, which a lot of historically a lot of place-based projects have done. It listens to the community it's based in, it's working with them, and it really is about the uniqueness of, of place and people. So it's not levelling up in the sense that the whole of Birmingham hasn't suddenly all become really equitable, but it's actually giving people in those areas a voice and agency in their space, and I think that's really powerful and really important. Okay, thank you. I'm going to give you a warning. I'm going to come back the other way. So, 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 so my second question is about, I mean, we've all been through a big experiment in terms of uh, the, the COVID pandemic and you know, forced us all, all online in a way which you know, we, you know, we hadn't experienced before. But in a sense, it also changes the nature of relationships, right? So before, I mean, we come here and hopefully meet someone new and that, that's the way people form relationships. And the creative industries are very relational, right? They are really dependent uh, much more than many other industries in terms of who you know 
and access. And I, I was sort of inter interested, I had a conversation with Lara before uh, this meeting, but you know, you made some inter really interesting observations about how going online changes the nature of access uh, relative to the, the, the real world. Or I was wondering if you could um, you know, uh, reflect on that in terms of what it means for leveling up and access to opportunities. Yeah, and it, it, that, it, I, mean, I think we accept there is a digital divide, so we have to kind of, you know, that is, it's not the standard that everyone is, has access to digital in the way that we mean, and not everyone's got smartphones, and the amount of, like, Macs in this room is, uh, is quite incredible, but, um, uh, but, but also, it's, it, but when we, if we, if we understand that, the, the, the nature of what digital did during lockdown is it's not a binary thing. It's not like all of a sudden we came out of lockdown and everything went back live again, because I think we proved from the lack of, there are audiences, I think it's 34% of audiences that never come back. Um, but in the meantime, people online were finding their own communities that they wanted to engage with. There was far more kind of um, engagement around culture from diverse communities um, that would not necessarily be seen in or feel comfortable in, again, mainstream public spaces. So I don't think it's binary. I don't think it's in real life versus digital. But I think it's that hybrid of experience, like, like today, actually, you know, but, um, but slightly more exciting, no offence. But, you know, it's, it's like looking at habit, having a... Sorry, no. I mean, this panel is amazing, obviously. Um, <laughs> But it's the best one. Um, but um, but how you so I think it's about amplifying and augmenting experiences. And by doing so, what that does is absolutely democratises access. So you create multiple entry points, you create multiple voices, you have far greater representation than you can you can within a physical space. And I think you know the thing that that makes it really exciting. Coming back to what the point of the question was, um, is that where you look at cross sector working, and we talked about creative tech this morning, and when you look at culture, creative industries, and digital, I don't think we've got anywhere near as to what the potential of that could be. But actually, how do you harness all of this in a way that is inclusive, addresses diversity, it includes representation, and we make working differently? So instead of just going, let's like, make something live and then add a digital element to it, what does making work look like when you make it differently? And that's, I think, where that kind of experience can really change things. Thank you. Josh? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think... You know, as we saw, there was so much there was so much during the pandemic which changed in terms of the way that people were working. And I think one of the things which we found is we've sort of been looking at this through the past couple of years through our, our PEC research and particularly through our, our um, creative radar work where we've been documenting the effect of companies through the pandemic, um, both before, during, and then kind of after. Um, one of the things which sort of, sort of come up from this, which I think is really interesting given this point about the shift to online, is a lot of the companies that we studied, and, and uh, you know, a, a majority of the companies that we studied, the, the bulk of their business is local. And it was local before the pandemic, and it's still local now. And so there's some really interesting things that we need to think about, that whilst everything went local, and even when we were talking to people who said they were actually talking to more people and looking more broadly for their ideas, those markets didn't really necessarily shift over the course of the pandemic. And I think that's really kind of interesting on two levels. I think on one level, there's, there's a point about trying to find ways to drive that local demand. If most businesses are, are likely to be uh, selling in the region in which they operate or within their town or within a, a local area, how can we boost that demand from a local perspective. But I think there's also an interesting question. I mean, there, there was conversation earlier today about kind of exporting and things like this, but there's also trying to provide opportunities for companies, again, that want to, to be able to sell their products more broadly and to target even more widely in the UK rather than necessarily just in more of a, a local, within my town, within my region um, area, and trying to be able to find markets that are a bit uh, more broad. But I think it's quite interesting that even despite all of these changes, in terms of at least the data that we've seen, the way that companies have sold hasn't actually really changed that much. The companies that were you know, selling widely were doing it before, and they're still doing it now. But trying to find ways to help companies to boost that access as a way of helping them to grow and within that local area, I think, is really important. OK, thank you, Josh. I think I think Lara said most of the things that, that I would have I would have sort of like pointed out really I think um, just sort of some sort of anecdotal stuff that that we picked up was um, one of the things that did change a lot during the pandemic was how some of the bigger buyers if you like interacted with smaller buyers so previously for example if you're a television company, you're, you're, especially if you're a, a, a newish television company, you don't have established relationships, you're literally waiting for months to be able to get in, to get an appointment with a commissioning editor and get in the room. You, you travel all the way in to the various places and you sit in the waiting room and hope that they're not going to keep you 
waiting for more than an hour, and sometimes they do. Um, and sometimes they even they cancel just as you're getting into the building. But anyway, um, the, one of the good things about around the pandemic was that um, commissioning editors had to be available and engaging in a different way, and they were able to do that online. And what we picked up from uh, some of the small TV businesses that are our members was that they were able to get much better access than they'd ever got before. And and so the who you know thing mattered less. Um, I don't have any evidence, uh, anecdotal or, or sort of all proper, um, to say whether or not that, that has changed. But I do think that, um, that our, our commitment to doing things differently, which was we convened this thing called the Creative Coalition, where we sort of we had about 650 different businesses for about 18 months um, in a constant and consistent conversation about how we may change. One of the things was, you know, let's not go back to the way things were. Now, um, you know, there are things that we can do to sort of to, to support that, but, um, but how, those, how some of those changes, like, for example, access is embedded. Um, I, I don't. I don't know that we've done any research on. I don't know whether or not there, that there is any research that looks at. You know, these are the things that we said we wanted to change. This is how we changed during the pandemic. Have we kept them? Have we kept them going? I. I don't know, but I do. I would I suggest that might be quite an interesting research project okay. for somebody I agree. to look at. Thank you. Paul. And picking up on what everyone else has said, I think the biggest danger in this is to overestimate the impact of the move to digital work. I'm not sure that's as prominent as we think it is. Um, and Laura's absolutely right about notions of geography and access and deprivation, skills deficit around some of the technologies that we have that we're not addressing, certainly in Northern Ireland, in the way that we would like to. Um, and even in terms of geography, and ob obviously I'm absolutely delighted to be here, but I still had to leave the house at five o'clock this morning in order to be here and to fly here with all the sustainability and green issues that that brings up um, to do this 40 minutes. So that, you know, the idea that digital has had that impact, I think we can overestimate it. Where I think it has had an impact um, is around the way in which we think about the digital and the way in which we think about our work. Now, I've no proof of this. It's another piece of research that would need to be done. But I suspect that we've moved in our thinking away from the old notions of economy that we had in general. You know, if, if the first industrial revolution was around, let's call it uh, around uh, manual labor um, and, and around um, physicality, and the second one was around brain power, I think we might be moving into what I call the economy of the heart. Now, that's not some hippie notion, although obviously you can see by me that as a Grateful Dead follower, you're either on the bus or you're not on the bus. <laughs> um, it's a notion about how people now want to do work which gives them some kind of contentment as well as some kind of decent standard of living, which comes back to the levelling up piece. And I think in order to do that, and I'm stealing here from Jeff Mulgan um, and from a Croatian writer called Shervak Horvat, we need to stop thinking about concepts like imagination and hope as abstract concepts and start thinking about how we strategize those things and build them into this policy making and not be ashamed of saying to policy makers, what are you doing to make imagination and hope for leveling up part of the policies that we're putting out there? And you can see that in action. It's not about giving people money. Caroline's absolutely right. When COVID came, we did a, a, a call um, which we call rewriting the narrative and we gave people 5,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I have to give the HRC some praise here because they allowed us to go slightly out of scope to do that. We ended up funding a woman who does tapestry. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me why, but we did. <laughs> um, that woman we then linked up with someone who does AI. Mm -hmm. um, and she has built a microcluster around doing that work. But it wasn't the money, it was the support mechanisms that were built around that. The money was irrelevant. It was the support she was getting from other experts and from the community and the network that were there. And this is not just about policy. This is really important because the more we get into technology that is not accessible to everybody, and AI is the prime example, the greater the distance between those of us who have access to that and those who don't. And those who don't 
will then be victims to superstition and conspiracy theories, which will drive the populist governments, which are the biggest danger to us, creating levelling up. So this is not about just policy for the creative industries. This is about ensuring that you have a society which is equitable and where the distance between those who have technologically and creatively is too far in the distance of those who haven't. And that is a real danger to us all, as we see in Trump and numerous politicians in the UK. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to, want to end by asking a question. I'm going to throw this question at you guys, because uh, which is from the audience. Uh, it's the po most popular question. It comes from Jane Ellison. She asks, public libraries uh, reach more people in communities than other creative organizations. Um, and I think that's a really interesting question. So I want to ask you, it's not just public libraries, but it's also about access, but you know, what piece of local infrastructure which is unappreciated do you think is particularly important in uh, galvanizing creative industries in, in different places? I'm throwing this at you, so you may <laughs> need um, a bit of thought. Well, it, it's, uh, you're right, absolutely right about public libraries. And actually, the, the biggest single piece of, um, I suppose, in, investment we have at the moment, which we shouldn't need, is actually about warm spaces. So it's got nothing to do with creative industries. So public libraries um, have become even more popular because they are warm spaces for people. Um, uh, I, I uh, run a warm space as well, so I, I know exactly what how people are using those spaces. Um, so it's it's not it, there's something about how you create spaces that feel inclusive. And at the moment, the single most important thing in this country, with the cost of living crisis, is having spaces where people can actually be warm and yeah. stay before they even start thinking about how they're using electricity or Wi-Fi or broadband or or anything like that. It goes to this idea of the infrastructure you mentioned earlier, you mm. know, the background. Anyone else got an observation you, on that? Well, I, I was going to say youth clubs, but I don't think they really exist anymore <laughs> in yeah. terms of infrastructure. You know, um, I'm a Scotty's daughter, and so schooling wasn't great for me because I went to about 10 different schools. Um, so there was no sort of real consistency. But, um, but youth club, you know, there was always a youth club, and that's where I sort of had the idea that I might do something creative with my life. Um, and I think that, you know, youth clubs provide that, I mean, provide that sort of safe space for kids to try out, you know, to do stuff with their peer groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and they've just, it's just a travesty that they um, have been, that those, you know, those budgets, um, and one can understand why the, with the pressure on local authorities, et cetera, but, you know, they just, they've just been cut more and more and more and more. Um, so what happens to those kids who, you know, who don't really enjoy going to school, whose parents can't take them to various places, et cetera, et cetera? We used to have, um, you know, we used to have hundreds of these of these things. And for and for many many people my age, I think, in the creative industries, um, that's how that was how we we sort of, you know, we got our first taste of some of, of the, what this could be for us because, you know, it wasn't we couldn't see it in our parents. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I would like to say youth clubs are a missed opportunity, but I worry that they probably don't exist anymore anyway. So <laughs> I would build on what Caroline is saying. I don't know whether the, how the context in England, Scotland, Wales, but in Northern Ireland we still have a very strong network of community centres, local community centres, and it's that locality which is a crucial piece. Because the two biggest problems in levelling up in Northern Ireland are rurality and peripherality, and class inequalities. And those local community centres address those in a way that the rest of us don't. And that's where we need to be putting our attention and putting some of our funding in order to get at those issues of access and equality. Okay, thank you. Josh, you have a thought? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with, with what, um, what everyone else is saying. I think having spaces within communities where community can, can come together, I think there's, there's a really interesting point that sort of feeds in, I think, to some of the points we've been talking about earlier about culture, where there's a lot of things around sort of community cohesion that we really need. Um, we, we need to have spaces where communities can come together, where, where smaller communities can form and people can make those types of links. And that can then be a gateway to all sorts of the other types of benefits that come from culture and things like that. But having that sort of baseline sort of social infrastructure and having that be robust, I think, is a really important starting place. That, we can, that then can be used to build on all sorts of things, benefits to the creative industries, but also benefits across the board in terms of well-being and health and all sorts of other stuff as well. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad nobody mentioned universities, because <laughs> universities are often seen as the universal solution to every problem, but uh, <laughs> not today. So that's good. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how much, how much time we've got left.
Oh, we've got loads of time. Okay, Ooh. so uh, that's cool. So um, I had another question, which was, um, what, you know, I think this country, one of the things that I noticed about this country, I've been here a long time, is we suffer from what I call initiative-itis, right? We always kind of create a new initiative, tends to be fairly small beer, and then we let it go for a while, and then we pull it up by the roots. We're usually pulling it up by the roots and seeing if it's growing most of the time. And then we kind of abandon it and uh, start something new. So I want to do think about what might be a successful venture which we could scale up. So what's something that, you know, looking to the future, if you had a, if you could give a policy advice to a uh, minister, you know, as a, as a proposal that which could be scaled up rather than a small, relatively small scale initiative uh, that, that could be taken forward? Yes, please. So I think there are, there, there are two things that are already um, in play at Sorry. the moment. So the first is obviously is the Creative Clusters Programme. Um, which, you know, uh, you know, it's just speechless that, you know, that, that actually it didn't, it didn't, it didn't get the, the, the funding that, um, in order for it to, um, to, uh, to scale. Yeah. One hopes that maybe we can, there can be something salvaged from it. But, you know, there is, there is a, an example of, um, I'm trying to think, but did Baz probably, I missed Baz's speech this morning, but I'm sure he gave you all the figures about how much money came, it, yeah. came out of it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's one thing. Um, the other are these, it's a sort of a new thing, but it's sort of an old thing with these new enterprise zones, more investment zones. Um, so which government recently announced, and as you will know, um, the government have also uh, made uh, creative industries one of its big five priority areas, you know, the, the mission, the, its mission. So um, I think that that offers a blueprint for, um, for uh, for local, you know, local local organisations, local authorities, businesses, et cetera, et cetera, to work together collectively and collaboratively to really scale what they've been doing in in, in their areas using that um, using that sort of policy lever. So I think that um, yeah, you're you're quite right. There's lots and lots of things that are already out there. Um, to be honest, most of them are, st are, are things that've been existing for forever. For example, they're just moving the deck chairs around a little bit. Um, it would be nice if we could have a more grown-up conversation that that was exactly what was happening. <laughs> it so would save a lot of time. Relabeling re things. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to come on the back of Caroline because she stole my clusters piece. <laughs> you know, as, a, as a director of the clusters, you'd expect me to say that. But mm. clusters, not necessarily in terms of funding but in terms of what a cluster does in order to create an infrastructure for the region and to create the network. And I'll give you an example of that if I may be a little bit anecdotal. I have colleagues in the audience today who worked with Future Screens, whom I met on the plane on the way over. And they said, where are you going? I told them, I was going, right, we're going there. We're going there to support you. And they're here in the audience, mm -hmm. coming out of the cluster, people I'd never met before in that way. And that's, that's a really important development. If I had to ask, give another one, it is to think about what the skills are that we need in 2030 and 2035. Not now. 65% of the jobs that our young people will do are not yet invented. We need to be thinking about what that skills base is for 2035 and 2040 and getting into that whole debate about how we get to that position. We're not very good at that in Northern Ireland. We're beginning to address it. We're beginning to look at that skills audit and what it might be. But for me, there's way too much what I call rear view mirror driving, trying to get somewhere by looking in the rear view mirror. That's not taking us anywhere. What is the future like? What are future skills like? And what are we doing about creating those skills? Because there will be a convergence of the industries, we're seeing it, and we need to know what skills we give our young people in order to ensure they can go into any aspect of this creative industry that we're creating. It's interesting, another uh, question online was uh, observed that uh, in the national curriculum, um, creativity is only mentioned three times, so uh, we not, might need a bit more than that. So either of you two want to chip in? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think first off, I completely agree on the point about clusters, investment, and skills. I mean, 110% on those. I mean, I think one of the things as well that we really need to be seeing is, I think at some point there has to be a climb back from the funding issues that our local authorities are facing. I mean, you know, you know, the the, the work that the PEC has done, talking about the um, real terms funding cuts to to uh, arts funding in local areas. I think we, we we need to be investing in capacity for local areas to be able to come up with these solutions, building on what we were just talking about before in terms of communities and community resources. We need to be in uh, providing the 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 
framework and the, the resources and sort of the space for local areas to be able to become empowered to try to use creativity and culture in all of these ways to be able to build themselves uh, uh, up and try to restore some of the things that have been lost over the past, past number of years in, in, all, all, in all number of ways. We need to try to get back to that. And I think that has to be a local solution. Thank you. Just for change, I'm in a bit contrary, because um, I don't think it's scaling up. Um, I think it's widening the parameters of what we're talking about with levelling up, because it's not never a one size fits all. And if you widen the parameters, then you start looking at things that are more considered and that are built with care, and, and are with care and authenticity at their heart. So that makes it much more relevant for when, when Portsmouth like Northern Ireland, for example, then it's the, you know the, the differences. Um, uh, geopolitically, for example, that, that are there that, that don't happen in England and then and the other issues that you have around the United Kingdom. And then you start looking at really embedded inclusive levelling up and that starts looking at that cities are really complex and they have very complex and nuanced parameters and they are made up of lots of different people with lots of different kind of intersectional lines of diversity. So when you start looking at levelling up, it has to be understand what all those parameters look like. But the main thing for me with levelling up is that it absolutely gives agency back to the people who have been systemically mar marginalised and they've had all of their power and agency revoked. And if levelling up for me is going to be successful, for want of a better word, all you're doing is you're giving back that power and agency to people that, um, that can then define whether, exactly what you were talking about, how can they define what's needed in their areas? Okay, so I'm going to thank you for that. This kind of relates to this last question, which comes from Edward, who asks, "How will we know when we've levelled up our creative nation? What does it What does it look like?" So, thanks for that, Edward. <laughs> answer to the Prime Minister, I think. Uh, the answer is that none of us are in the room, and it's filled with young people who have come through the levelling up we created. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any uh, Any further observations? I don't think it will just be young people. I think it will be all people. Um, you know, it's people that are socially isolated. They're vulnerable. They, you know, it's so that I've heard a really weird saying this because it, it should, people feel more included. People should be included. You know, we're we're not giving them the power to feel included, um, but but actually that people feel they can take part in anything they want to, in the way that they want to, and that would be what success looks like. So it's not necessarily we're earning lots of money economically or I'm working in this, but people have the choice of what they want to be and participate in. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. I think it's about also understanding the causes. I think we actually don't really understand the causes. Partly we don't understand what it means, right? There's a great, as I started by this conversation, the levelling up is a fantastic phrase. Probably one of the things Boris Johnson was really good at was uh, phrase making. And, uh, but it's also very vague, right? So what does it actually mean? Uh, it means a lot of different things to different people. So I think we really don't understand totally the, you know, the causes of why we are such a, an unequal nation. And, uh, Therefore, we don't really know what, how to fully address it. But thank you. I think it has been an interesting panel. Hopefully, it was uh, interesting to, to you there. And uh, I would like to thank the panel for their contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you.